Welcome everybody to this IPSC webinar series on Palestine. This is our second evening. Uh, last evening, uh, uh, we had just an introduction and we had quite a quite a large group on. I know we have a lot of registered uh, people. We've gone over the hundreds now on this one. Uh, we had a lot last week and we certainly looks like we're going to have a similar large group this week. And thank you very much for coming on a bank holiday weekend when I, I know everyone could be doing something else. Um, tonight is our second session, as, as I said. Um, and this is the, the, the running lineup for, for the five. So, uh, this is our, uh, the, we have tonight is a history on, of Palestine, an overview of the history from the late 1800s up to, and including key events during 1947, 1948, uh, 1967 and key events in more recent times. Our presenter is Colin Colonel O'Duffick. He's a history teacher a sec in secondary, in his secondary school. Uh, he's uh, been with IPSC for a long time, and he's a founder member of a founding member of Teachers for Palestine. Um, there's a link there uh, for Teachers for Palestine as well. We can we will share it. We will share the slides. We'll record the slide. We'll record the session, and we'll make we'll put a pack together for for people, both people who uh, were able to uh, register and attend, and also for people who haven't been able to attend. Uh, you can see there we've three more sessions. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about those at the end. And just to say how this session is going to run, we're going to run for an hour. It's a Zoom webinar. Uh, we're going to, uh, Connell is going to present for about 40 minutes. We're going to have Q&A for about uh, 20 after that. Uh, uh, so attendee details are not shown on screen. So it's just, you can see just the, the presenters, et cetera. Et cetera. Um, Live questions can only be submitted uh, using the Q&A button, which you can see on your screen. Otherwise, we'd just be overwhelmed with, uh, so we've turned off the chat because we just wouldn't be able to handle all the chat during the pre presentation. Uh, and responses will either be verbally or they will be by text. Uh, if you have any other general questions, you can send them to education at IPSC. IPSC. Uh, now, I said we may do a short poll, but I don't think we'll have time for one of those tonight. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And you can see Connell there again. Connell, I'm going to hand over to you. You can start sharing your screen. And uh, so you'll go for about 35, 40 minutes, uh, and then we'll we'll switch to Q&A. OK. That sounds great. And uh, thank you very much, Brian and Tom. Um, it's a pleasure and an honor to be able to do this with uh, you tonight as part of the series. Um, now, apologies in advance. Uh, I'm going to do my absolute best to cram over a century of history into about 30 minutes. So we'll see how I get on. There will be massive gaps and things left out, but um, but by all means, uh, this is not intended to be a be all and end all complete, you know, um, thorough history of the conflict, but a good position, you know, to start from or to freshen yourself up or to familiarize yourself with. You know what I mean? Some of the some of the counterpoints to a lot of the arguments we hear from the other side as well. So um, I'm just going to jump um, back in time briefly to about the year 1870. Or at least I thought that was going to happen when I pressed uh, a button on my laptop. Let's press this button instead. There we go. So um, <clears throat> Europe in the late 19th century, uh, you know, we can recognize some of the national borders. A lot of them are quite different. Um, the reason for that being that uh, Europe, like much of the world, was um, divided up into European empires at this point. Now, one thing that starts to emerge in 19th century Europe is a lot of nationalist movements. As Irish people, we're very familiar with, uh, you know, the rise of the Fenians at this time. But also you have like movements for Hungarian independence, movements to restore historic Poland. And notably, um, one of the most, I would say, you know, most oppressed and uh, persecuted populations in Europe at that time were Europe's population of mostly Ashkenazi Jews. Um, now, a group of secular Jews, it's very important to note that these were, you know, in many ways kind of um, coming from this milieu of modern 19th century nationalism, as opposed to some kind of messianic reaching back through time to, to you know, biblical texts and stuff like that. This group of secular Jews, um, established the Zionist movement, um, the goal of which was to create a land in which um, the Jewish people would not have to be a minority and that this was the way that they could guarantee themselves against future persecution. Um, 
Now, the trouble with this uh, plan right from the beginning is where should it go? Uh, they wanted, or at least they talked about having, um, you know, places that were not populated. Alaska was discussed as a possibility, um, but also, you know, because of the historical connection, the land of Palestine. And at that point, the word Palestine wasn't controversial. They were calling it Palestine as well. Um, now, in Europe at the time, they many of them believed that the land was mostly unpopulated, uh, you know, with a few groups of Arabs, quote, Arabs here and there. Um, so it was something that was kind of uh, brought into question as they started to travel there, started to, to realise that, yeah, there are people living here, they have an identity, um, which we'll come back to soon. And that confronts them with the question, what do we do about that? Do we aim for an inclusive uh, state encompassing both populations? Do we just go somewhere else? Um, or do we forcibly expel them? Um, so just to have a quick look here through some of the points there. Um, so uh, I've listed the, um, the Dreyfus Affair, which was occurring in the 1890s and early 1900s. That was a major scandal in Europe where a French um, captain, um, Alfred Dreyfus, was um, accused of treason against the state. He was sent off to the colonies to hard labour. It was a trial riveted with anti-Semitism and was a galvanising force for you know the arguments against what was happening. You could also talk about Russian pogroms, which are happening at the same time. A lot of um, early immigrants to Palestine, early Jewish immigrants to Palestine were from the Russian Empire. Um, um, but it should also be noted that a lot of uh, radical Jewish people from the Russian Empire were anti-Zionist at that point as well. Uh, the first Zionist Congress held in Basel in Switzerland in 1897. Um, and immigration from Palestine is beginning from that point, uh, as are the first um, elements of a militant uh, Zionist nationalism uh, in the form of Bar Gaiora, which was a... Uh, paramilitary Jewish group that is, you know, established in Palestine at around this time. Now, I mentioned the the question that the early Zionist movement was going to have to reconcile itself with. Do they boot the Jews off the land and or do, do they boot the Palestinians off the land in order to claim it? And as of the 1914 uh, Zionist Congress, uh, they've effectively decided that, yes, this is the plan, that this is what will have to happen um, large portions of the native Arab population will have to be moved. Um, First World War kicks into gear, and uh, one of the participants in the uh, on the Axis side was uh, the Turkish Ottoman Empire, who at this point controls, um, you know, a huge chunk of the Middle East, particularly um, on the western side of us, uh, you know around where Turkey itself is, but also extending down south as far as um, as Palestine. So in uh, 1916, um, the French and the British uh, put together a plan for how they would carve up the Ottoman Empire following the, the impending fall of the empire at the end of the war. And as you can see here, uh, it's crazy to think of the amount of power that can go into you know, the world shaking events that can be based on simple meetings between, you know, elite people representing different governments. But you have a line drawn across where the more, where the modern border between Israel and Lebanon exists. And then down here and straight up through the Middle East, creating a lot of modern nation states, you know, dividing Kurdistan, dividing uh, our um, creating, you know, the, the borders of places like modern Syria, modern Iraq, and, you know, and crucially, uh, Mandate Palestine, uh, which now makes up the, uh, you know, the sum total of historic Palestine, the sum total of the territory controlled by Israel, you might say, you know, the, including the um, supposed future Palestinian state. Um, this direction of things um you know the the 1914 um zionist congress the sykes picot agreement come together uh with further emphasis in 1917 uh in the balfour declaration where the british government uh declares its intention now to create a homeland for the jewish people on uh on the land of uh, british mandate palestine which has now fallen or which you know uh, the following year would fall under their control.
Uh, Connell, mm -hmm. just I'm just wondering there. Uh, the slide I'm seeing at the moment is the origins of Zionism. Have you moved on from that? Uh, no, I'm still on it. Oh, you're still on it. Sorry, sorry. Okay, sorry about that. Not at all. Not all good. Um, although I'm finished with it now. So, um, Palestine before Israel. So, um, <clears throat> this was a you know diverse land going back for thousands of years. Um, I don't want to dwell too much on the ancient past, but absolutely Jewish people have a connection to it, as do Palestinians. This is something shown both through, you know, cultural heritage, connection to the land, multitude of historical sources, DNA evidence, um, you know, that they're like like all places, like all modern geographical sites, um, you know, people will have lived there throughout time and the modern denizens or inhabitants of a place are made up of people who travel to come to there and people who you know pass through there and usually we're a mix of all of those different groups you know what i mean we're we as you know um as eth like i as an ethnically irish person i'm not purely from the island of ireland that's not how population works um also as a cultural entity you know the the term Palestine goes way, way back. The I believe the Egyptians even referred to the Peleset people uh, living around where modern Gaza is today. So um, so there is a connection there. Now, I believe the, the origins of this conflict are fundamentally modern and belong to the modern era, begin, you know, and in this case, beginning in the late 19th century and continuing through the 20th century. And I believe that's a better way to look at this conflict because otherwise we're going into racial claims and biblical claims and stuff like that. Um, I think it's, um, you know, I think the only moral way really to look at this is through the prism of um, modern history and human rights and uh, the inalienable rights of of people. Um, so um, just to have a quick uh, look through here. So Palestine under the British mandate was majority Arab speaking Muslims. 11% uh, of the population was Jewish. Now, this number had risen over the previous decades. There was always a Jewish population in Palestine. Um, although at this point, you know, in the 1920s, 30s, um, the, the number had risen with immigration from Europe. Um, uh, also Christians, Druze, Africans. Uh, so, that, you know, it was a diverse uh, population. One area, one thing about this, uh, about Palestine, which is different from Ireland, is that it's at the you know, the, the focal point between three continents, whereas we were on the far flung regions and others. So you did have a lot of people traveling through and a lot of um, a lot of ethnic diversity as a result of that, which is a, a very cool thing about the land. Um, the Christian population in uh, Palestine still exists, although it is worth pointing out that they've declined over the years. Uh, demographically, uh, they tended to belong to um, just a slightly better off uh, social class and as life under occupation and uh, and colonialism got worse and worse. They were often the ones in a better position to leave. Although, as I said, there is still uh, a very important and very significant Christian population in Palestine to this day. Um, continuing on. So um, <clears throat> uh, one major thing that happens um, as a catalyst towards things really coming to a head um, is that anti-Semitism persists in Europe. So the Zionist movement has been in place for decades, but separate to that, there are plenty of Jewish people still living in Europe. And it is also not a settled idea that this is, even among the Jewish pop, the, the, the Jewish people of Europe, that this is the direction to go, that they should all move to a, a country they've no you know, living connection to. Um, however, uh, along comes um, Adolf Hitler and his genocidal plans against Jewish people and others in Europe, um, resulting in the deaths of six million Jews and uh, the Allied conquest of the German Reich. Now, this leaves a situation where a huge portion of Europe's Jews don't want to go home. They don't want to be in the village that, you know, their their neighbours, um, you know, were perfectly happy to see them carried off to, you know, the likes of Auschwitz and stuff like that, understandably. Uh, on top of that, though, the Allied powers didn't want them for the same xenophobic reasons that, you know, um, Western powers to this day are often very reluctant to take in refugees. And so the idea that they could just outsource this problem um, by 
making it a colonial project in the Middle East kind of suited them and also lined up with a lot of arguments that Zionists have been making for decades. Um, you know, when kind of the lobbying end of their movement involved talking to European leaders who in many cases were anti-Semitic and saying, look, you don't want us on your golf courses. We don't want to be there either. What if we were an essentially Western country in the Middle East? Which, you know, look at Israel's place in the world today. You know, they're the members of uh, their participants in Eurovision, for example, something we saw in the news recently. They're, they are a Western country. You know what I mean? Culturally, um, economically and uh, geopolitically. That's their alignment. They just happen to be in the Middle East. They often use terms themselves about like, oh, we're the villa in the jungle and so on. Um, it is, you know, it's, it's the colonial nature of it. Um, so <clears throat> in uh, the next couple of years, uh, violence in uh, Palestine increases. Um, the political descendants of uh, the paramilitary group Bar Gaiora, so now you have the, Har the Haganah, the Stern Gang, um, and groups like this who are fighting a guerrilla war against the British occupation. So it makes, it, this is where kind of the the run, the run speed through run of history uh, is starting to show. So um, Britain had declared that, you know, the empire intended to create uh, a Jewish state in Palestine. The, at this point, you know, over two decades have passed and um, a lot of Jewish settlers have become increasingly frustrated and turned to violence to accomplish this. Um, you know, a, a number of actions happened, including the, the bombing of the King David Hotel, which was a major news story at that time. Um, and in order to create a settlement, the newly formed United Nations um, decided to partition the land. And that's the uh, map I have over here on the left, uh, where you can see the blue area is what the UN has proposed would make up the state of Israel. And the uh, orange area was what was proposed to make up the state of Palestine. Now, 60% of historic Palestine in this map would have gone to uh, the newly forming Jewish state, while 40% uh, would have gone to the native Palestinians. Um, it would be the, the equivalent of, you know, what of nearly half of Ireland being handed to, you know, an, an invading country as part of a settlement. Um, you know, no reflection of population or anything like that. Uh, so um, naturally, it was rejected by the Palestinians. It was also rejected by the neighboring Arab states, accepted by Israel, because, of course, it's a very good deal. They're getting 60 percent of the territory. Um, so I'm including this uh, graphic here of the, you know, the disappearing map of Palestine, uh, which I'm sure most, if not all of you have seen before. Um, but this map here, it says, uh, oh, sorry, yeah. So the first one shows Jewish settlements as of 1946. The UN partition plan in 1947, that's the same map. Um, the I'm just pointing out that never actually existed as a set of borders for Israel. The first set of borders that really emerge are over here on the third map. Um, so following uh, Israel's declaration of independence in uh, 1948, it was... You know, a, a war broke out with the neighboring Arab states. Again, we're talking about claiming over half of uh, historic Palestine with the intention kind of implicit that they wanted more. So, of course, this resulted in war. You don't have to be a fan of uh, Arab leaders in the 1940s to believe that this was going to be a justified cause of war. Um, <clears throat> so Israel ended up seizing more territory than the UN was going to give it and holding on to that. Uh, meanwhile, Gaza fell under the control of um, the Egyptians and uh, the West Bank was now under the control of Jordan. So um, <clears throat> another important thing to note during um, the during the Nakba was uh, the expulsion of 750,000 Palestinians from their homes. Um, as part of this. So this was something that was intended. Uh, David Ben-Gurion fully understood that that was part and parcel of what establishing uh, a state of Israel would entail. And uh, ultimately, the Israeli founding fathers were happy to do so. Um, you also have um, the Der Yassan massacre, where, um, where uh, Zionist paramilitaries um, rounded up um, all of the the men in the small town of Deryasan and killed between uh, 
you know, I think the estimates are range between 100 and 300, I think, uh, civilians. Um, so news of this and other similar massacres started to spread uh, through Palestinian towns and villages. And suddenly uh, the desire to to stay and fight it out when you're anticipating genocide uh, massively decreases. So people started to leave. They brought the deeds to their homes with them. They brought the keys with them, uh, things which were symbols and also had a very symbols of the, the desire to return, but also had a very practical thing that we intend to return. After the war ends, people can usually go home. It's usually an option they're given. Uh, although these uh, refugees learned a very harsh lesson in 1948 that they would not be allowed to return. Um, so when we look at, you know, Gaza today and, you know, people in Gaza who choose to stay or, you know, even in, at the beginning of the conflict, there was talk of the people who weren't leaving northern Gaza were choosing to stay. It's because they've been taught again and again that if they go, they won't be able to come back. And it's a rock and a hard choice. Do you want death or do you want expulsion? Um, or is there some hope of sticking it out? Um, moving on. Um, so um, <clears throat> in the years after um, Israel establishes itself, uh, the Palestinians continue to suffer, but uh, internationally are not at the forefront of world politics. People kind of, I don't want to say they forgot they existed, but in many cases, they weren't aware that there was a subjugated Palestinian population um, at this point. So um, we have Jordan and Egypt uh, controlling the West Bank and Gaza. We have Israel doing this kind of charm offensive around the world, planting forests, often named after Western leaders like JFK or even Eamon de Valera, often over the ruins of Palestinian villages. So, you know, you have the symbolism that like we're planting beautiful forests and it kind of erases the image of the of the forced expulsions and the ethnic cleansing. But you also have the these forests serving a very practical purpose. They're literally covering the crimes. Um, you have Israel developing a close relationship with the USA, although it should be important to point out that this relationship is different from the relationship as it currently exists now. Uh, Israel at this point didn't have a massive um lobbying apparatus, you know, such as APAC or groups like the ADL and stuff like that, where they can exert a huge amount of pressure on the American political system. Um, so, for example, uh, in the 1950s, when Israel, uh, having been prodded by um, or prodded to do so by Britain and France, um, what should we call it, uh, captured the Suez Canal in Egypt, it was America, and not just America, but America under the Republican president, Dwight D. Eisenhower, who told them to back off, and they did. Um, so it just it shows not that there wasn't a close relationship, not that America was not a big supporter of Israel and some of its worst tendencies, but that this relationship has evolved and changed in different ways over the years, particularly in America's loss of a willingness to push against Israel from time to time. That's not to praise America's actions in the 1950s either. Um, in 1967, um, tensions escalated once more between Israel and its neighbors, resulting in the 1967 Six Day War. Now, again, I don't wanna to get too much into detail about the specifics of the war, um, although uh, Israel definitively won and won very, very uh, decisively. They, I think, uh, launched a number of airstrikes against uh, Egypt's air force right at the beginning of the war, decimating them and assuring a very quick uh, victory. Um, where this becomes relevant to Palestinians and the changing face of, um, of their struggle and their story is that from this point forward, uh, the West Bank and Gaza are now directly administered by Israel and under Israeli control. Um, I'm so here we have uh, Israeli soldiers approaching, approaching the Al-Quds Mosque in Jerusalem, um, which, you know, also contains the Wailing Wall. And there was a, a moment of great jubilation for Israelis that they're finally the homecoming to Jerusalem and all this sort of stuff. Uh, this, the, this is the moment of the Naqsa for Palestinians where, um, you know, where whatever protections they had uh, under the rule of their neighboring Arabs uh, governments, they're now directly under the rule of uh, the colonial power, which in many cases for the refugees living in the West Bank and Gaza was the power that expelled them from their homes to begin with. Um, so here's a map 
of uh, Israeli controlled territory after uh, the 1967 war. And as we can see, uh, the West Bank and Gaza are now under Israeli control. Uh, the Golan Heights, uh, Syrian territory, which Israel captured, is now also under Israeli control. It is under Israeli control to this day, for that matter. It is still sovereign uh, Syrian territory and Israel is still illegally occupying it. And down to the south, we have this massive area of the Sinai Peninsula, um, which had been captured uh, from Egypt. Now, Israel would hold on to this until 1979. Uh, like its other territories captured, they started to build settlements here. It's important to point out the building of settlements on captured land is a war crime and is recognized as such under international law. Um, in this case, though, and again, this goes back to Israel's changing relationship to world power, but in uh, the in 1979, during peace talks with Egypt and under, you know, a notable pressure from the USA, Israel uh, gave up the Sinai Peninsula, gave it back to Egypt, uh, and also dismantled all of their settlements on the way out to make sure that the infrastructure and buildings couldn't be of any use to uh, to the state of Egypt. Um. So. Uh, um, anything else I've left out there? Just settlement construction begins after this point and also direct rule by um, by Israel. Uh, this is also the point where the occupation begins. So you could argue in terms of technicality and stuff like that, uh, Israel, well, you say the pre-1967 borders of Israel, the bit that's dark blue here, um, is not considered under military occupation. It is, uh, it is colonized land, it is ethnically cleansed land. Uh, however, from this point forward, um, soldiers are deployed to uh, Gaza and the West Bank, and they become what's known as the Occupied Palestinian Territories. So, um, <clears throat> actually, I'll jump back to this slide because we've a little bit to go before we get to the 90s. Uh, although, again, speed run, I'm going to skip over a lot. So uh, the PLO emerge, uh, they're founded in 1964, but they come into their own after the 1967 war. They are an umbrella group of Palestinian political parties and paramilitary groups. They engage in a struggle for the next uh, 20 or so years, uh, eventually culminating in, um, you know, in the uh, culminating and also um, accompanied by the um, First Intifada, which is a Palestinian uprising in uh, the late 1980s. Now, as we move to the 1990s, um, you know, America is experiencing its peace dividend following the end of the Cold War, something that resulted in peace talks in, or, you know, a, American engagement in peace talks in Ireland, also Israel-Palestine, also uh, arguably the, uh, the first war in Iraq as well. Uh, basically, how can is how can the USA secure its global, um, its global hegemony at this point? Whether it's through peace, whether it's through war, how do they secure their position now that they have the the advantage of having a defeated enemy? Um, so they the, this results in a genuinely historic moment that um raises a lot of people's hopes, um, that uh that some kind of peace can be assured. The PLO. Um, you know, uh, accept the terms where they uh, unilaterally accept the existence of the state of Israel as a precondition for getting into talks. Uh, and here we have uh, Palestinian leader uh, Yasser Arafat um, shaking hands with um, the Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin. Now, it's worth pointing out that uh, Rabin, uh, you know, say what you like about Arafat, is good faith in uh, getting into negotiations, you know, from a position of lack of power anyway, uh, involved him recognizing the state of Israel. That was a precondition that he had to follow. Rabin, on the other hand, was giving speeches in Israel saying that these talks would not would, would not result in a Palestinian state. Um, so on the one hand, this is what was being promised to Arafat and to the Palestinians. This was be what was being promised internationally to the world, that a Palestinian state is going to come out of this. And yet, uh, the Israeli prime minister is trying to save face at home and saying that, no, don't worry, no Palestinian state will come out of this. Uh, unfortunately for him, this was still too much for the Israeli far right who assassinated him later that year. Um, so uh, another, so that was one major stymieing factor on the peace 
process. Another one that is very much uh, to be considered, especially when we talk about the prospects or the viability of a future Palestinian state, is that settlement construction uh, accelerated during this era. I guess Israel was having its own peace dividend. Um, so the at this point, the, the occupied territories of Gaza and the West Bank make up 20% of historic Palestine. So in 1947, we were talking about 40%. Now we're talking about 20%. I believe 22%, if it might be slightly off. Um, but if you're building a network of settlements uh, through the West Bank and Gaza, you're massively reducing that 20%, both in terms of literal land that you're willing to let the Palestinians hold on to, but also land that they can access. If you're building roads that can only be accessed by Israeli Jews, then there's obstructions for Palestinians. They can't get around those roads. They can't access their own land. They can't visit their neighbors and so on. Um, so it, the settlement construction is a massive, massive issue, uh, which, um, you know, in terms of in terms of evidence of Israel's bad faith in um, in in the in the peace pro uh, bad faith approach to the peace process, this is uh, this is very very damning evidence, I believe. Um, ultimately, um, the peace process concludes with uh, the second intifada, a Palestinian uprising, uh, which goes from two thousand to two thousand and five. Um, <clears throat> at this point, uh, we start to see you know the the infrastructure and the the palestinian um you know leadership structure uh, as it has existed through the 90s begin to fracture um so i'll move on to my next slide here um so uh what we have down at the bottom left here is a picture of uh israel's uh as it calls it its separation wall sometimes called its um the apartheid wall, my uh, people who are more sympathetic to Palestinians, or sometimes I'd, I'd refer to it as the annexation wall, because I think something that's very important to point out is that it doesn't go neatly along the, the 1967 border. It links up with some settlements. It cuts deep into Palestinian territory. Uh, so just by constructing the wall in itself, going deep into the West Bank, they are claiming territory which does not belong to them according to international law. Uh, in 2004, the ICJ uh, rules Israel's wall to be illegal. Uh, and this creates a great moment of hope for Palestinians that now, finally, you know, the great powers of the world and the international community will sanction Israel in some way and prevent them from continuing to steal their land, which doesn't happen, which results in a couple of uh, significant developments in Palestinian history. One is uh, the creation of the um, Boycott Divestment Sanctions Movement in 2005. This is called for and run by the Palestinian Boycott National Committee, uh, an umbrella group of 170 civil society organizations, which represents a real cross-section of Palestinian civil society, uh, modeled on the similar successful campaign that was done to aid the uh, South African ANC in overthrowing apartheid in South Africa. Um, <clears throat> and um, the other significant development is the emergence of, of Hamas at this point, and I suppose the, uh, the decline of Fatah and uh, the fracturing of Gaza and the West Bank. Now, for time constraints, I'm going to focus mostly on Gaza from this point forward. Uh, I believe just obviously the, what's happening in the West Bank at the moment is horrifying. Hundreds of people have been killed as part of the same genocide that is happening in uh, in Gaza. Uh, however, the numbers in Gaza are, are greater by the thousand. And just as I said, for time constraints, I'm going to focus on this. It's not because I believe the West Bank is less important at all or uh, or the Palestinian citizens of Israel who make up one in five citizens of Israel and are also subject to apartheid. So um, <clears throat> the other side will often say uh, that Gaza is not occupied and has not been occupied since 2005 when Israel withdrew all of its settlements unilaterally. Um, and here we have an image that was, you know, many images like it were broadcast around the world in 2005. Some of us might remember seeing them on the news. Uh, of Israeli settlers protesting and having to be forcibly removed by the IDF and Israeli police. Now, what this story doesn't tell us 
and something I would always place emphasis on in a history class is context. In 2004, we are four years in, or in 2004, yeah, we're three and a half, four years into the Second Intifada. We're also a year into the war in Iraq. And the US is under pressure to show that it's delivering something in the Middle East. Meanwhile, uh, and that includes, you know, it's the failures of its ally, Israel. So they're exerting pressure on Ariel Sharon to show that there's something happening. Meanwhile, from Sharon's perspective, um, and should be pointed out that Ariel Sharon is no friend to to Palestinians or to uh, or to Arab populations in general. If we look at his record in in the, the Lebanon War in the nineteen eighties, um, his uh, complicity, to say the least, in the Sabra Shatia massacres of Palestinian refugee camps. Or even in the year 2000, his famous uh, March on Jerusalem, which is one of the major instigating factors in the uh, Second Intifada. However, he realized that um, Gaza is an absolute hotbed at this point. Hamas was starting to thrive there. The place was an open revolt and it was more difficult to control than the West Bank, where they had the somewhat compliant um, government of Fatah and the PLO. So they withdrew from Gaza. Um, the uh, so I'm just glancing down at my notes right now. Uh, one of Sharon's ministers, Dov Weisglas, um, said at the time, effectively, this whole package that is called the Palestinian state, with all that it entails, has been removed from our agenda uh, indefinitely. So as Israel pulled back, they believed that they were securing their efforts in the West Bank, um, and the continued expansion of settlements there, while also continuing to uh, more effectively control the population of Gaza. Um, in 05, uh, I'd, I'd like to, uh, by the way, thank um, Dan Finn, longtime IPSC member and uh, author for Jacobin magazine for some of the, the stats that I have here. Um, <clears throat> Uh, a U.S. document uh, said that it was clear that Israel would have exclusive authority over Gaza's airspace and its territorial waters, and that Israel would supply its electricity, water, gas and petrol at full price, that the Israeli shekel would remain the currency in Gaza, and uh, that Israel's interior ministry would, would retain control of identity cards, population data, births, deaths and marriages. So effectively, the Gazan population... Gaza's borders, Gaza's people, its infrastructure, its government income in, in the form of taxes uh, would all remain under the strict control of Israeli authorities. Um, I think it was uh, Daniel Mate a couple of months ago, I thought, put it very well when he said that the removal of the prison guards or sorry, the redeployment of prison guards to the perimeter of the prison does not mean it is no longer a prison. And that is exactly what happened in Gaza in 2005. And that is why Gaza remains an occupied territory to this day, despite that argument that is uh, sometimes made. Um, how are we doing for time? OK, a better race from here on. So um, in uh, January 2006, Hamas win uh, a massive victory in uh, the elections. It was clear that they were going to do a lot better than before at this point. A lot of which is to do with uh, the weakening of Fatah and, you know, also the vice grip and under which Fatah was being kept by the Israeli government. Um, the demand often placed on um, on Arafat and Abbas at this point in, or in the 2000s was that they had to dismantle the terrorist infrastructure. So they couldn't get Hamas to agree to a ceasefire alongside Fatah. They had to destroy Hamas. In other words, the own, as a precondition for peace, they had to fight a civil war amongst Palestinians. Um, which left them in a very weak position, in a position where they were losing support rapidly uh, among Palestinians. So we see 1996, uh, the yellow for Fatah. They were, you know, clearly the dominant party in Palestinian politics compared to 2006, where Fatah have declined massively and Hamas have grown. So when we look at Hamas's victory, we have to look at the context in which it happened. Um, at this point, also, uh, sorry, Hamas win the election uh, and then. Uh, Hamas and Fatah agreed to a power sharing agreement um, as a means of avoiding this Palestinian civil war. 
Uh, and it's at this point that the US government starts to meet up with a guy called Mohammed Dahlan, who was a member of Fatah and a police commander in Gaza. Uh, so Lieutenant Keith Dayton uh, of the uh, of the Amer of America uh, met with Dahlan and promised him 86 million to dismantle the infrastructure of terrorism, the phrase we keep hearing. Um, at which point he begins allegedly to plan the assassination of Hamas leaders. Um, at this point, we're getting into very murky, the very murky world of intelligence and different groups kind of spying on each other and what happens. But essentially, Hamas get wind of all of this and decide to launch a preemptive strike against Fatah's forces in Gaza, resulting in the separation of Gaza and Hamas, or sorry, of Gaza and uh, and the West Bank. So the Gaza Strip, uh, such as it is, is now under the such as uh, such as power can be held by any Palestinian group in Gaza, uh, Hamas are now the the effective government. Um, although, as I said, minus a lot of uh, things that a government would normally have, like access to its own territorial waters and so on. Um, in the West Bank, we have some areas that are under Palestinian kind of autonomous rule. So the uh, the dark orange represents uh, full, you know, supposed full Palestinian control. Um, then we have uh, the Area B sections, which are, you know, shared Israeli and Palestinian control. And then we have the areas that are full, under full Israeli occupation. So this 22% of historic Palestine is mostly under Israeli control to this day. Um, a couple of points about uh, the siege of Gaza since it did began. Since it did began, uh, our friend Dov Weisglass, uh, after the Battle of Gaza, as Israel began its siege, said famously that we're not starving the Palestinians or putting them on a diet, which, once again, war crime. Uh, you should not be restricting the diet of any civilian population, full stop. Um, <clears throat> there were attempts by the international community, as far as civil society and activists go, to break the siege. Uh, one powerful thing that was happening in the late 2000s and into the early 2010s was the flotilla movement. I believe there's another flotilla um, being planned at the moment. Now, um, they th there was a very powerful symbolism to these boats being able to break the siege and get into Gaza and show solidarity and also bring supplies. Um, I, however, that this movement was dealt a major blow uh, with the attack on uh the Mavi Marmara. So several ships had been in had been intercepted before, but this time a Turkish uh ship was not only intercepted, but um several of the activists on it were killed, including a 19-year-old um now I, I I remember speaking to Irish activists at the time who were on a boat nearby and saying that like they deliberately lined their boats up beside the Mavi Marmara because they thought the the Turkish boat is in the one with brown people was most likely to face the harshest repression. And unfortunately, they were completely correct. Um, then we get into uh, Israel's incursions into Gaza in this time. So Operation Cast Lead, uh, which began on the 27th of December uh, 2008 and continued on into early 2009, um, ultimately killed uh, 1,400 Palestinians. Um, now, I'm just going to run through a few figures in relation to uh, deaths. Very sorry, Tom. I'm going to speed up as much as I can here. So um, in Operation Cast Lead, uh, three Israeli civilians were killed from rockets being fired out of Gaza. Ten soldiers were killed. So um, as, just because it, it's a, an argument often made by Israel that, you know, they're targeting our civilians, we're targeting their soldiers. If we look at the numbers of dead, the reverse appears to be the real pattern. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> primarily, so of the the thirteen Israelis killed at this point, um, most were soldiers. Uh, on the other hand, uh, for the Palestinians, nine hundred civilians were killed as opposed to five hundred fighters. Um, Operation Pillar of Cloud in twenty twelve, uh, four Israeli civilians were killed as opposed to two uh, Israeli soldiers. Uh, and if we look at the other side, we have um. Uh, 100 uh, Palestinian civilians killed and then uh, 60 to 120 um, fighters. That number is 
there's some variations in these numbers. I compared sources from um, the Palestinian Center for Human Rights as well as uh, Israeli groups like Beth Salem and stuff. To so there's they mostly agree. You know what I mean? There aren't serious disagreements, but just where there are, I took note of them. Uh, Operation Defensive Edge in 2014. Uh, we have six Israeli civilians killed as opposed to 67 soldiers. And on the Palestinian side, we have 1,600 civilians killed as opposed to 700 soldiers. So the broad pattern is that Hamas are killing more Israeli soldiers uh, than they are Israeli civilians. That the Israeli numbers of dead on the whole are much larger, are much lower anyway. And that uh, the Israelis are killing more Palestinian civilians than they are killing fighters. Something that is clear to this day uh, when we look at the 36,000 plus um, Palestinians who've been killed in Gaza in the last few months. And uh, also another precursor to, um, to where we are currently in 2018, there was a months long non-violent a uh, protest movement organized out of Gaza where civilians marched towards uh, the the fence. I don't even want to call it a border because this area is under Israeli control. It is already essentially part of an Eretz Israel, and that's part of the problem. Um, but they marched towards the border, symbolically wanting to walk towards their uh, their home, their homes. They're not even their homeland, their their literal homes that they were forcibly removed from in 1948. And many of them were gunned down. Multiple reports from uh, different human rights groups who are operating in the area about attacks on the press, attacks on medics, also Israel's policy of shooting to maim rather than kill. Because if you can, you know, cause someone to lose an arm or a leg, then you not only remove them, but you remove their support structure. So anyone in their family or their friends who now need to look after them can't be active for uh, for Palestinian liberation or Palestinian rights or anything like that. Um, so we, we get some very gruesome stuff leading up to it. And then um, <clears throat> for want of saving time, I might call it there because I'm conscious it is 10 to 8 now. Sorry, Tom. Okay, ten. thanks so much for that, Connell. That's, that, that was actually an amazing run through of a hundred years uh, or more of of history so uh, many thanks uh, uh, you've done a great job on that um yes so we're you've got a little bit over time but not to worry uh we have a few questions however uh and uh what i said in the chat was that i would uh i can't answer them so i'm gonna ask you <laughs> uh so anyway i much but much better to get your perspective on this. Now, the first one is quite long, uh, but the best way I think I can I can I can, I can do I, I shared it in the chat, so uh, the participants will have seen the question, but you 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 won't. So I'm just gonna read through it. Uh, I, and and uh, the question is, I think it is important to to point out that anti-Zionism is as old as any as Zionism. Not all European Jews agreed with the Zionist project, and there is a history of socialist opposition to Zionism. For example, the Bundist movement, uh, who believed that Jews should fight for a better society where, where, wherever they lived. Uh, without Britain and the League of Nations, Zionism would not have got any traction. This is clear from statements made by early Zionists who saw clearly the need to take over as much land as possible through organizations such as Jewish national funds and the need for violence to establish the colonial state, which they called the, a Jewish homeland. Useful reading, they say, on this uh, would be Katakami's uh, Married to Another Man. Uh, would you consider holding a session entirely about the founding myths of Zionism? Now, first of all, I will say uh, we have these five sessions, which we thought we would uh, go through first. We're certainly open to running further sessions. Uh, and I, I can't commit to running a further session yet on Zionism, but it certainly looks like an interesting one. And we'd have to check with, with, with Connell and maybe some other people as regards how we might run that. So from our perspective, from the IP, IPSC perspective, we're certainly interested in, in, in engaging with our audience in terms of what are the useful next steps after this. And, and so, yes, but Connell, I'll hand it over to you in terms of your response on that. Um, no, I agree completely. Um, <clears throat> there was a huge amount of division on anti on uh, anti Zionism right from the beginning, uh, as you pointed out. The Bundists, uh, you also had initially religious Jews really objected because there's nothing in in Jewish scripture about 
having this happen as you know at there's like as far as I understand it, I'm not an expert on Jewish theology. Um, the the understanding at that time was that this was something that would happen with the the arrival of the Messiah, not something that they were supposed to try and make happen themselves. Um, you also have, I believe, one of the leaders of the uprising in the Warsaw ghetto was um resolutely anti-Zionist and wrote extensively about his beliefs as an anti-Zionist. So a hundred percent, this was not received wisdom. Until I think the years after uh, after World War Two and uh, a massive Jewish refugee crisis, and I think it was very convenient for Western powers to kind of give in to this movement that had been pushing for fifty plus years at this point. Uh, so yeah, I agree completely. Um, if people are in, like obviously that we didn't do anything specifically on this, but on in Teachers for Palestine, we had former chairperson of IPSC David Landy talk about just the do a talk on the relationship between the Jewish diaspora and Israel. And he talks a bit about some of this in that episode, although it wasn't the main focus of the episode either. Okay. Um, next question. As an alternative approach to teaching the history of Palestine or any con colonized country, can I ask, we start with the people of the country and then tell the story from their perspective. Uh, one mistake Europeans make from the colonizing West is to start the history of Palestine with an image of Europe, uh, we then follow the narrative along the sea routes of the colonizers. Just maybe a comment on that. Yeah, uh, that's an entirely fair criticism. Um, I, I chose to begin it here just to, I think one of the things that makes this situation a little bit unique, it's very, very familiar to colonization in a lot of aspects, but is the is the fact that Zionism is a slightly strange movement and it's also the reason why Zionism is kind of in the modern day kind of like a zombie western colonial project um in that you know there's, there's still plenty of western imperialism but the literal exporting of settlements and all this sort of stuff is it feels like a relic from the past and I think that's because it's a it's a it's a little bit anomalous as well and that's why I thought that I would include that history of european antisemitism and begin from there uh, but no, you're you're dead right. I I agree. Uh, you know, broadly in the perspective of imperialism, I'd, I'd say the same about Irish history or African history or wherever else. It is good to to include to center the the perspectives of the the colonized there. Um, it's a, it's a fair criticism. It was just a decision I made in terms of structuring this um this particular talk. But yeah, point taken. Okay. Uh... Another question. I think I heard recently the Zionist par paramilitary brigades would not have take, been able to ethnically et ethnically cleanse the land successfully without British support. It was the British military m that made that difference. Is that true? To be honest, I'm not entirely sure. I, I've uh, My understanding is that the British, a bit like uh, India at this point, they were just keen to uh, to kind of wash their hands of it as much as possible. That's not to say they didn't want to have a role in what new uh, state would would emerge from that. So no, I like they definitely wanted, uh, as declared by the Balfour Declaration, they wanted the emergence of a Jewish state and they would have done what they could to facilitate it. I'm not sure to what extent they were, um, you know, they were openly moving their troops around to support the Zionist militias. Um, but I, this would be somewhere where I'd, uh, I'd yield to someone who would be more of an expert on uh, 1948 than I am. Okay, uh, another question. Uh, how did Hamas start? Uh, I read somewhere that Israel had something to do with it. Just wondering the, about the origins of, of Hamas. Yeah, so Hamas uh, emerged in Gaza in the early 1980s. Um, they were initially kind of connected to the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood. Um, Israeli intelligence service, uh, Shin Bet, uh, identified Hamas early on as a potential opposition to Fatah. So, um, you know, there's plenty of Israeli sources that have confirmed this as well. Um, the Israeli intelligence basically started to facilitate Hamas's growth, you know, against their rivals and so on, um, especially through the first Intifada and through the 1990s. Um, as they wanted to, to weaken Fatah and the PLO, and, you know, all that stuff we were saying earlier about the in the 2000s and this pressure that's coming down on Fatah, that they have to dismantle the terrorist infrastructure, the phrase they kept using. 
basically they mean like, oh, well, you know, we, we can't do a peace deal with you if you've still got this group Hamas. So it was advantageous to uh, to Israel to have Hamas there. Um, and, you know, that was that was essentially the role they played in building up Hamas. Now, does that still exist? I, I don't know if that's a, as much of a factor. There are advantages to Israel still to this day. You know, the, the West Bank and Gaza are fundamentally separated. Uh, there is no Palestinian ANC, like no united Palestinian political group. Um, so all of this is still to the advantage of Israel. But on the other hand, Hamas are far more politically and militarily effective than I think they were banking on when they uh, were, you know, were covertly supporting them uh, through the 1980s. Yeah. Question on uh, with, with regard to schools and the teaching of history in schools. Uh, when will this be included, I guess, uh, referring to your perspective, uh, in the modern day history taught in schools? Um, like to hear your perspective on that as a history teacher. Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, and I'm, I'm a history teacher. I'm also a member of um, Teachers for Palestine. That's something we directly wanted to address uh, earlier this year with our Let's Talk About Palestine um, fortnight. And the argument we were making then is that modern um, subject specifications and curricula, like the teaching of Palestine fits into a lot of it, and especially in you know subjects like, for example, secondary school level, I could talk about like CSPE, history, um, the new politics course that's going to come in for the Leaving Cert and so on. Um, where it's absent, though, is in the textbooks. You'll at best get like a glancing mention of it in most history textbooks. It's essentially not covered and it leaves a lot of people finishing school none the wiser about the origins of this conflict or why it's there. So I do believe it definitely needs to be pushed. And I also think that like it's as 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 we argued as Teachers for Palestine, it is um the there's space for it in the curriculum. It just has to be teachers have to be resourced in teaching it. Uh, so this desperately needs to happen. Uh, I agree. And it's something that we we hope we'll see more of um as we uh, work towards it yeah a question here about universities in uh, in palestine uh the, the the person says the the participant says it surprised me when i heard several months ago that there were several universities in palestine i think they have now been destroyed but uh it bill uh let's say speaks on the stability i think didn't exist uh, not sure when they were built. Hope that Irish universities twin with them at least nominally. Uh, this actually mirrors a, something that someone said to me recently. That when I when I drew their attention to the fact that museums were were being uh, bombed and the cold culture of of Palestinians was being destroyed, the comment which I was shocked with from a very well read person was, "Wow, I didn't realize there was museums in Gaza." Right, uh, and and it just goes to show a little bit i'm not saying but but by the um by the uh questioner here but you know part of the israeli project is to portray the palestinians as not having a, a, a culture not having a history and whatever and these these kind of myths obviously have unfortunately proved to 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 be successful in, in some ways any comments on that Cole? yeah 100 percent um so yeah, Palestinians have universities, they have schools, they have uh, all of the elements of a culture that you would that you would expect, um, and it is a common thing not just in Palestine but across, um, across any colonized country that um, that on the one hand these institutions and the desire to to repress them are part of the colonial you know infrastructure and the colonial plan, um, but also the desire to preserve them and to promote them becomes a massive. A massively important thing for the colonized people. Um, Franz Fanon, the um, the psychiatrist uh, who was all, you know, also a post colonial writer and all this sort of stuff. Um, he talked about how like the the colonial state aims to make the the subjugated people believe that their history begins with their colonization, that they were savages beforehand, that they were disparate bands, and so on. And ultimately, a necessary part of reclaiming that history and reclaiming that culture is is taking pride um, in in that history or pushing that history, uh, pushing that identity forward, creating institutions and so on. As uh, I think uh, Jean-Paul Sartre in his introduction to Fanon's book, The Wretched of the Earth, uh, when he's talking about the you know decolonization as it's happening all across the world in the 1960s. 
um, says that, uh, you know, the colonized people, they're no longer talking to us. They're talking about us and they don't care if we hear or what we think. And there's something there about the confidence and the need to be able to articulate and to um, and to develop your own culture on its own strength. Absolutely. Uh, so, yeah, I think universities and so on are very important to uh, Palestinians. And um, it's also just, you know, how many Palestinians seem to be highly educated? I, I don't have stats on it, but I definitely know that I've come across a lot of Palestinians with PhDs. There seems to be a high concentration of it. And it it makes sense, you know, um, uh, the, the North in the 1960s and 70s was producing a huge number of highly educated Catholics as well. Subjugated populations will will try to advance themselves in whatever ways they can. Yeah, uh, a couple of easy ones here. Uh, will you be supplying the slides? Yes, we will. Will we uh, supply references? Uh, and I refer to uh, a pack that we will be putting together at the end of the five presentations. So I think we'll wait till the five are finished uh, and then we'll actually put the, put the pack together with the slide slide decks uh, and, and references, et etc. Also uh, a comment that Jews for Palestine, Ireland would be happy to collaborate uh, on any future sessions. So that's great to hear. We'll certainly follow hey, up Sue. on that. <laughs> Thank you, Sue. Um, and also the, the question uh, from uh, history from a Palestinian perspective, uh, another comment that that would be a very interesting session. Um, in a two-state solution, what would be the prospect of United linking the illegal settlements in Gaza with the frontiers of a Palestinian state? Mm. That's a tricky one. Sorry, I missed the question. What was it, sorry? In a two-state solution, what would be the prospect of uniting and linking the illegal settlements and Gaza with the frontiers of the Palestinian state? Mm, not sure. Uniting the... Um, I'm not sure what's meant by the, the uniting of the, of, the, of the settlements with the frontiers. What I will say is, now, you know, IPSC, we, we don't take positions on internal Palestinian politics. Um, but... Certainly, the existence of the settlements presents a massive problem for, you know, anyone who is a believer in a two-state solution. Uh, do you dismantle the settlements and resettle, you know, um, tens of thousands of people? It, it's an option, but it's a messy option. Uh, or do you um, establish a Palestinian state, even though huge chunks of it are colonized and you have a, you know, it, it's messy. Um regardless uh so the settlements are a massive issue it's one of the reasons why they are as i said recognized as a crime under international law and rightly so yeah a uh, question or uh, on something we discussed uh, briefly did the british supply weapons and military assistance to the zionists someone uh, a contributor said uh, if you go to rashid khalidi's book uh, 100 years on palestine it gives uh, which i've read and which i i agree uh, basically, he, he, it, it clearly shows that that the British massively supported the Israeli uh, uh, forces before uh, 1947, 1948. And without uh, my personal view is, yes, without the British, I mean, the British are largely responsible for training the Israelis, uh, for, for supplying them with weapons, etc., and for su suppressing the, the local Palestinian militias and arresting them and killing them. Right. So without. Yes, certainly. I, I think that is uh, I would agree with that statement. Yeah. Um, OK, another comment here, just comment. This genocide is not just a humanitarian catastrophe, but also cultural genocide. Many artists, poets, writers have been killed and museums destroyed. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Lots of people saying thanks, Colm. Connell, sorry. Um, how would you how would you propose articulating to those who feel the trauma of the Holocaust that there are ways to heal Jewish trauma without having their own ethno state today? That's a good question. To be honest, I think that's one that uh, that's one that I think should be a, a, an internal Jewish argument. Um, now, I think when it comes to the real applications of where some people, whether or not that trauma is a factor, is also, I believe, an internal Jewish argument. But for those, let's say, who are, you know, who are led into having um, terrible views on Palestinians and support for terrible treatment of Palestinians and using the Holocaust as an excuse. I think where that becomes a real political position, absolutely we challenge it. Where it comes to how do they heal their psyche from uh, the trauma that was inflicted on their grandparents or, or themselves in some cases of surviving 
um, of, of people who are alive uh, through the Holocaust. I don't know. I, I honestly don't know how you do it, but I would say don't take it out on Palestinians. They had nothing to do with it. OK, a uh, question here. We have quite a few questions, which we won't be able to get to all of them, but we'll 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 try and uh, include them in some way. Uh, how do anti-apartheid, anti-Zionist groups like Beth Salem, who is a human rights Israeli group, fare in Israeli public life? Not well, I imagine. But I'm curious about the social and political schisms and how anti-Zionist groups reconcile their position with 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 still living, I, I guess, as they're still living and working in Israel. So I would my comment on that would be yes, the the work of Beth Salem is extremely valuable very challenging in terms of like uh you know how the support or lack of support they they get within israel but yes an absolutely wonderful organization any comment on that connell yeah um so um as you know israel is sliding further and further in the direction of fascism um you know anti-zionist uh israelis as well as more modern like I don't want to give them too much credit because, you know, the liberal Zionist governments like, you know, the Labour governments of Ehud Olmert and Sipi Livni and all this sort of stuff, they horrific things to Palestinians. But the voices of that kind of like liberal tendency are either eroded or they're just becoming further radicalised to the right as well. Uh, but the truly principled people are completely marginalised in Israeli society as far as their politics go. If you are refusing it in the army, you... Uh, you go to jail and then you can't work in um, the public sector afterwards for the rest of your life. Uh, a lot of people do end up leaving the country. Um, you know, I've met a few Israelis in, uh, you know, in, in, in a European context who are anti-Zionist and, you know, no longer living in Israel. And I think that's, it's a big part of it. It's, it must be very hard to square. It's still existing there when you do. But for those who stay, I, I would venture a guess that part of the reason they do is because, one of the practical support they offer to Palestinians, there are Israelis, you know, who will travel to the West Bank and, and join protests and stuff like that. And their presence probably guarantees a, a certain amount or, you know, I mean, might bring a certain amount of safety to the Palestinian locals who are protesting. Like, I, I suppose, like any of us, if we see a practical value to remaining, then, you know, then the question is there as to why. Now, as I said, I'm not an anti-Zionist Israeli. It would not be a a position I'd really desire to be in, but um, but it's worth pointing out there are a lot of principled anti-Zionist Israelis, but they would be the first to say they're a complete minority, and that's essentially the reason why we need a massive international solidarity movement and we need a boycott movement to make Israel a pariah state because that's that's how we win this. Yes, um. Look, we've gone a, a bit over eight o'clock. Uh, Brian could uh, has been keeping an eye on the questions there and answering some of the questions. And I was just wondering, Brian, if you wanted to uh, add anything verbally to the questions you've already uh, responded to. Uh, yes, indeed. I, <clears throat> excuse me. I hope I didn't shortchange anyone by asking, uh, by answering their question instead of having Connell answer it. Um, one of the questions which I wanted to uh, repeat to Connell I mean, I can only answer it for myself, but I'd like to hear Connell's re reply. A book list, or or what are your top recommendations to get to grips with all of this in terms of books, Connell? Ooh. Um, geez, I have to think. There's a lot of different things I've picked up and read over the years. Um, one, actually, that uh, if you wanted to peruse and get a, you know, a Palestinian perspective on, from, you know, uh, that's a, a very good, solid analysis, um uh well is it in the bookshop of me uh i was gonna say edward saeed's politics of dispossession is a collection of essays that he wrote over many years which uh gets into a lot of just the palestinian experience and um and what they've been through there are also uh some good israeli sources as well um i if you, from if you wanted the israeli perspective and particularly around an anti-zionist uh Mikko Peled's, um what was it? The General Sun is yes. is a decent read. Um, I mentioned I, I mentioned Dan Finn earlier. He uh, did some good. He originally I think did this for IPSC, but was re, uh, he repurposed and republished 
uh, a piece on the the two thousands and the importance of that decade in shaping uh, Palestine as it currently is. Um, sorry, I want to throw in more Palestinian uh, sources. I'm just caught a little bit. Uh, Absolutely, there was another question. There was another question in the meantime, which was how do organisations like B'Tselem fare in Israeli public life? Uh, do they get grief on the streets if they try to mobilize? Do they get their offices raided and so forth? I know that uh, even in, in 2012 or so, the Israeli state enacted a law saying that any organization that raises awareness of Al-Nakba, such as the organization Zakrat, who raise awareness of where Palestinian villages were, they an organization that raises awareness of Al-Nakba does not get state funding in the Israeli state. That's a fact, but I haven't heard of uh, B'Tselem having their offices raided or anything like that. I suppose they are in a privileged position per se in uh, in in society, you know, like fair play to them for doing what they do and all. So, uh, is, is, yes, you, I haven't heard of direct repression of B'Tselem. Um, and I, again, as I said earlier, like, yeah, even in like anti-Zionist Israelis are still in a better position than Palestinians or Palestinian activists or anything like that. You know what I mean? There's there's definitely a clear line of privilege there. Um, that's not to say that they can't be subject to repression as well. Uh, I just, I don't have the details on on state repression of B'Tselem. Yeah, for sure. But there is, um, there is a kind of far right, um, anti like uh, incitement against them. And I know that there was, people might be interested in this. There was a, a time a number of years ago when a settler organization had created this video, which was characterizing uh, leftist groups as they saw it. It was an animated video and it was playing into a number of anti-Semitic tropes. Uh, I'll try to throw it in the chat if I can find it. Uh, it's quite grim viewing in its own way. Um, and yeah, that that's, that's also like there were certain times, for instance, in 2014, or no doubt now when like if a uh, if human rights organizations wanted to mobilize on the streets in the Israeli state, they'd be kind of taking their life in their hands, you know. So, yeah, yeah, um, they were some of the interesting questions that I had seen there. OK, uh, sorry, I'm just answering another question there. All right. OK, um, I think we'll have to wrap it there, guys. Uh, so uh, just to keep it to somewhere near near the hour. So thank you for everybody for um, for joining us tonight. Um, we will. The session is recorded. We will make it available uh, when we can. We're uh, as Brian would say, we're very quite busy in lots of areas at the moment. So we will uh, make the sessions available. Uh, we'll put them uh, online for people. Um, we will put together a pack of uh, you know some of the the slides or the slides, uh, the the presentations, uh, the questions, the references, uh, and we will have some sort of a consultation process where we will look at you know are these just five sessions that we leave it there or are there other areas that we would kind of uh, that that there is sufficient interest in that we'd run uh, uh, other webinars. So we will. Uh, uh, have a think about that, look at that process and see, uh, I mean, I think the feeling is that, yes, there are other areas that people would be interested in, but uh, I think uh, we could probably have quite a number of those sessions. So we have we have to figure out, you know, what is, what is the, the, the area that people are more, most interested in? And maybe there are some specialist areas that maybe maybe there's 10 people interested in a particular area or 20 or whatever. Um, and, uh, you know, we're certainly interested in your feedback on that. Any feedback you can send directly to to ourselves at education at ipsc.ie. So uh, thank you for joining in. Thank you to uh, Connell. Thank you to Brian. And thank you for, to, to my colleagues in IPSC. And we'll see you next time. Uh, like the, the next session is a, a from a Palestinian perspective. Uh, Walla uh, Ajawi is a is a young Palestinian woman with a great, per, a wonderful speaker. Uh, you've seen her on the uh, you've heard her on the national marches, and uh, I'm really looking forward to Walla's uh, perspective from a Palestinian perspective. Uh, of you know that's 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 most important for us to keep learning to keep, keep our minds open and to keep following the Palestinian lead on this. So thank you very much and good night.